We're starting a new book study this evening in the book of 1 Thessalonians. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians, and if you need a Bible, the ushers are happy to hand you a Bible if you raise a hand in their direction. 1 Thessalonians is where we're going to be this evening. And if you take a Bible from one of our ushers, it's page 877. So quite the icy, dreary night, and, uh, and so, I'm so I'm so glad to see you out this evening as we start a new book study together here. First Thessalonians, we're going to be obviously chapter 1. Let's pause and pray. Lord, as we open up our Bibles now, we're just so grateful that we can come together in your house and study your word together. And we pray as we dive into this new book that, as always, you will use it to speak to our own hearts. We're reading a letter that was written almost 2,000 years ago, but we thank you that you speak to us through the pages of Scripture, even in our generation. So use this book, and tonight use chapter 1 in our lives to strengthen us and encourage us and to draw us to yourself, Lord. Thank you for your word. We love you, and we're thankful that you reveal yourself through Scripture. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and everyone again said, Amen. All right, so we're heading now through the Bible from left to right, but as you go from Colossians, which is what we finished last week, to 1 Thessalonians, even though you're going chronologically in your Bible from left to right, you're not going chronologically in time, because we're actually going backwards from Colossians to 1 Thessalonians about 10 years. Colossians was written around 62 AD. 1 Thessalonians was written around 51, 52, 53 AD. And so we're actually going backwards in time. So your Bible is not necessarily arranged in chronological order. 1 Thessalonians was one of the earliest of Paul's letters that he wrote just after Galatians, which was the first letter that Paul wrote, and then 1 Thessalonians. Uh, so what I'd like to do first, as I often do whenever we start a new book, is just to kind of give you a little bit of the background, get a little bit of a, the historic reference, and then we'll, we'll read 1 Thessalonians. We're also going to look in the book of Acts to see the story leading up to this letter. But in the meantime, those of you who like to take notes about all of this information, first some information about the city of Thessalonica. Uh, it is located in modern Greece. It is a port city along the Macedonian Gulf, along the northwest corner of the Aegean Sea. The population of Thessalonica in Paul's day in the first century was around 200,000 plus, which is considered a very large city in that day. And it was originally named Therma. The city was called Therma because of the hot springs that were found there. It would be renamed after Alexander the Great's half-sister in 315 BC. Her name was Thessalonike, and so the city took on her name after the half-sister of Alexander the Great. Today, however, the city is called sometimes Thessaloniki, but most often uh, it is called Salonika, with a population of more than 300,000. Uh, here is actually a picture of a sunset of uh, Salonika today, a very, very pretty uh, sit, city along the Aegean Sea. Um, even though this was a city at one time with a large Jewish population, uh, in 1941 uh, the Germans took over Greece uh, during World War II, and in particular, this city of uh, Salonika or Thessalonica. And um, as a result, uh, the persecution of the Jews under Hitler's Nazi regime resulted in, first, the Jews being uh, uh, sequestered to a ghetto side of the, of the rails in Thessalonica, and then subsequent to that, in 1943, they were rounded up and taken to concentration camps. As many as 54,000 Jews were taken from this city in 1943, which represented 90% of the Jewish population. Today, in the city of Salonika, there are only roughly 1,200 Jews. But at one time, there were well over 60,000. But again, World War II took its devastating toll on Jews around the world, and in particular here in Salonika. 
So that's the background of the city itself. Now a little bit about the church at Thessalonica because this is a letter written to the church of this city. The church of Thessalonica was founded by Paul around 51, 52 AD after only a three week visit during his second missionary journey, which is a very remarkable thing when you think about it because you know to get a church going and our church was a church plant 26 years ago. I can tell you, to get a church going off the ground usually takes more than three weeks. This is just a testimony of God's grace in, in establishing this church under Paul's leadership. And then after three weeks, the thing just excelled. Uh, and it was a mix of mostly Gentile believers, those who came to faith in Christ who were Gentiles, and also Jews who came to faith in Christ, but it was mostly made up of Gentile believers and some Jewish believers. We'll see that in a moment when we look back at the reference point in Acts chapter 17. The, this first letter to the Thessalonians, because you'll notice in your Bibles that after 1 Thessalonians follows 2 Thessalonians, another letter that Paul writes to this church. But the first letter to the Thessalonians was written by Paul while he was in Corinth around the year 52, 53 AD, which is about one year after he had founded the church. And the main theme of this letter, get excited friends, because the main theme of this letter is the second coming of Christ. This is a great book having to do with the return of Jesus. Now, I never want to assume that everybody understands some of the basics or fundamentals of the faith. So for those of you who don't know, uh, when Jesus Christ was crucified, he, he was dead and buried for three days. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And then the Bible says that he appeared for 40 days in his resurrected state. And then he ascended back into heaven from which he came where he is presently seated at the right hand of the Father. This is what the Bible teaches. And the Bible also teaches that Jesus is coming again. He's coming back to earth. We don't know when, but God has it as an appointed time when Jesus will return to the earth. And um, he is waiting. He is waiting for as many people as possible to become saved. But then the Lord is going to return again to the earth. Now there are... Uh, about 300 plus, give or take, prophecies about the first coming of Jesus in the Old Testament. Things related to when he would come to be born of a virgin in Bethlehem, uh, a descendant of the tribe of Judah, um, a Nazarene. Um, and, and so many prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the first coming of Jesus. But in the sum total of Scripture, Old and New Testament, there are three times as many prophecies related to his second coming as related to his first. So there are more than a thousand prophecies that speak about the second coming of Christ. So how, how many of you understand that's pretty good evidence because if Jesus fulfilled all 300 plus prophecies, all of them came true related to his first coming, and now there are more than a thousand prophecies related to his second coming, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And because we don't know, we should always be ready for his imminent return. Now, even though there are three times as many prophecies in the Bible related to the second coming of Christ as compared to his first coming, there is not yet a prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before he comes to remove the church from the earth. In other words, there are prophecies still to be fulfilled. But ever since Israel became a unified nation again, on May the 14th, 1948, there is no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled in order for Christ to come back for us. So that means we should be looking and waiting and watching. Now, it's not a fearful thing. You know, we shouldn't be afraid. We should be looking forward to our ultimate, you know, redemption when Christ returns. But it should put within us a strong sense of how we should live in light of the fact that he could come at any time. That really has a lot to do with this letter to the Thessalonians here, the first, first Thessalonians, because Paul's going to write to them and he's going to say, listen, I want you to know about the second coming of Christ. He's gonna come again, and I want you to be prepared, and I want you to be ready. I want you to be watching. I want you to know that it's imminent. 
Now, what actually happened is that the Thessalonians were so encouraged by that news that they checked out. I mean, they literally decided, well, if Jesus is coming again, even though we don't know when, it could be at any time, and they believed they were living with that expectancy in their own day as much as we should now, and how many of you understand, do a little bit of the math, right? I mean, this is first century, Jesus didn't return. We're closer to a second coming right now than, we, than they were then, and yet they lived in a spirit of expectancy for the second coming of Christ. How much more should we live in a spirit of expectancy? But because they were so expectant of his imminent return, they checked out. They decided we don't need to go to work anymore. We don't need a job because he's coming again. And so they just checked out. They just sat at home eating Twinkies, and they just like, but Jesus is coming any time. So we don't, we don't need to worry about anything. And in 2 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, which we'll get to, you know, in, in a few months probably, but in 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, hey, listen, wake up. You still need to work. Go get a job. And he actually says in 2 Thessalonians, if a man does not work, he shall not eat. So he says, don't check out. You need to still live with the understanding that Christ could return at any moment, but you don't check out of life. You engage your culture, you live like you normally would live, but you just always have in mind that he could come at any time, and so therefore it should prompt us and motivate us to live a life of holiness in devotion to the Lord because we want to be ready whenever that might be. So that, that has to do with a lot of what's behind uh, this first letter to the Thessalonians. And you'll see also in 2 Thessalonians too. In 2 Thessalonians, he's going to talk about the Antichrist. So there's a lot between these two letters here having to do with when Christ comes in the cloud to receive the church, and uh, which we call the rapture. That's in chapter 4 of this, of this letter. He's also going to talk uh, about uh, what we need to do in preparation for second coming. And then 2 Thessalonians, he talks about the, the man of lawlessness, the one doomed to destruction. He talks about the Antichrist and, and, and the temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem. So there's a lot here in First and Second Thessalonians. Um, what I love about this letter is, is that when you, when you look at the three main points that he tries to make here, it's divided very neatly like this. Trials will come, that's chapters one through three. Temptations will come, that's chapter four. And Jesus will come, that's chapters four and five. So he's going to talk about how, how there's going to be some trials in life. That's the first few chapters. And we're going to be tempted in different ways, our sin nature is going to be tempted. And he says, but I just want you to know that in addition to trials coming and temptations coming, Jesus is coming. And, and in, you know, he, he concentrates on the return of Christ in chapters 4 and 5. But I just want to point out, if you'll survey your Bibles with me, he ends every chapter. He ends every single chapter here in First Thessalonians with some reference to the return of Christ. Look at how chapter 1 ends. Just glance with me in your Bibles. Chapter 1, verse 10, for example. He says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Because he's going to talk about the tribulation a little bit too. Look at how chapter 2 ends. Go to chapter 2, uh, verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Look at the way chapter 3 ends. Look at verse 13 of chapter 3. He says, May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. And that's not angels. That's a reference to the saints who return with Christ. We'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 3. Look at how chapter 4 ends. Chapter 4, verse 16 for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and, and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And then look at the, at the way chapter 5 ends, verse uh, 23, 523, may God himself, the God of peace, 
sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is, this is going to be a great time together on Wednesdays as we take a look here at, at the hope of the church. The hope of the church is our reunion with Christ and that he's coming again. And so Paul has much to say here in 1 Thessalonians. Now, again, at the risk of kind of belaboring the introduction, I do think it's important for us to always get the context of something. So if you'll maybe put a pen or pencil or a piece of paper there in 1 Thessalonians and go backwards, hang a left and go to the book of Acts. Because I want you to see how this church even was birthed. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 17. We're not going to spend too much time here in Acts 17, but I just wanted to, to give you a little bit of the context here. So in Acts chapter 17, this is Paul's second missionary journey. We're in the middle of his second missionary journey, which starts uh, right around the a end of chapter 15. And, um, and, and Timothy and Paul and Silas are now traveling together. Paul, at the end of chapter 15, Paul has a little disagreement with Barnabas uh, over, over uh, Barnabas' uh, nephew or cousin, depending on the translation, John Mark. So Paul and Barnabas has, have a sharp disagreement. They decide to part company. Paul then chooses another traveling companion by the name of Silas and also Timothy joins him. And so we're in the middle of the second missionary journey. He's going throughout uh, Asia Minor, which is, you know, a lot of Europe, primarily the region of Turkey and Greece. And here in chapter 17, we read this, verse 1. When they had passed through Am Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So that's what, that's the city we're talking about here, where there was a Jewish synagogue. All right, pause. You would not have a Jewish synagogue in a city or a town unless there was the presence of at least 10 Jewish men. So we know here in Thessalonica that there was a Jewish presence because there is a synagogue here. And verse 2 says, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ that just means the Messiah, that's Jesus, had to suffer and rise from the dead. Okay, so Paul, Paul's primary mission really was to the Gentiles, but he went to the Jew first. And, and he was a Jew. So we went first to the Jews to explain from their own Jewish scriptures how Christ is revealed and who Christ is and how Jesus is the Savior of the world who rose from the dead. And so he starts in a synagogue, and it tells us here that he spends three Sabbath days. That's how we know that he spent three weeks with them, because he goes in and teaches in the synagogue, reasoning with them. It's, it's the Greek word dialogomei, which is, we get our English word dialogue. He dialogues with them. He teaches them. He reasons with them from the scriptures, from the Old Testament. Our, what we have is our Old Testament. And, and he explains to them and proves from the scriptures, from all these 300 plus prophecies about Christ related to his first coming, proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. So, so Paul is this master apologist and he's using Jewish scriptures to reason in a Jewish synagogue with the Jewish people about the truth of the Messiah Jesus. And, he's, and he says to them, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Verse 4, some of the Jews were persuaded. Okay, not all. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. So that's how we know one of the bullet points earlier was that this church was initially made up of a few, some Jews who believed, but it says a large number of Greeks, those are the Gentiles, come to faith in Christ. So it's predominantly a Gentile church, but it also does have some Jewish believers as well. Verse five, but the Jews were jealous. Now this speaks about the Jews who didn't believe. So you have a whole group of Jews who didn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah as a result of Paul's preaching. And they, they, they become jealous, they become angry. And it says, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. It's like, you know, if you don't know what to do, just get a mob, you know, and start a riot in the city. And they rushed 
to this guy named Jason to Jason's house, because that apparently is where Paul and, and Silas and Timothy were staying. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Now, listen, notice what's happening here. Now, this is the day when only Caesar's king and only Caesar's lord, okay? Augustus, Augustus, Augustus for Caesar means the divine one. At this time in Roman history, the Caesars were regarded as deity. You know, it's interesting though, when you look at how the real truth survives, you know, who is the one we exalt now? It's the Lord Jesus. I mean, whatever happened to the Caesars? What's their claim to fame? A salad. <laughs> That's it. And a really mad monkey on the planet of the apes. But other than that, there's no claim to fame. The Caesars are gone even though they were in a position of deifying themselves, Augustus. So in this day, you can, only, you can only glorify Caesar. He's Lord. He's King. What is so tragic here is that the Jews who didn't believe in Jesus were so offended by that that they use their own culture as a weapon against the message of the gospel. So we don't like this whole thing about Jesus. Isn't Caesar supposed to be our king? No, God is always the king. But it's convenient for them to even use out of expediency their own culture as a way to try to discredit and defame the message of the gospel. So that's, they start this riot and, and, and they're saying all these things about, you know, look, these guys are here against Caesar and, and, and this one called Jesus. Verse eight, when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil and then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. And in verse 10, it says, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. So apparently they had hidden Paul and Silas somewhere and they can't find him. So they hauled Jason, you know, out and they beat him up. And, and, then, and then they go back to wherever Paul and Silas is like, you need to get out of town. Your life is in danger. Your life is in jeopardy here. And so they go off to Berea. And uh, which is about 50 miles away from Thessalonica, jump down to verse 13. And when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So that's your introduction to the church at Thessalonica. And the reason I think it's important to frame the context is, again, for two reasons. One, Paul only spent three Sabbath days there. So three Saturdays in a row, Paul goes to the synagogue, talks about Jesus. At the end of three weeks, you have a small group of Jews and a large number of Greek Gentiles who come to faith in Christ. And after three weeks, this riot ensues. Paul has to get out of Dodge or else he's going to die, okay? And he then makes his way to Berea and then to Athens. And, and these, these Jewish people who didn't believe in Christ stir up trouble, you know, you'd think that it would be enough for, okay, finally, Paul left town, good riddance. You'd, you'd think that they might think that. No, they're going to go 50 miles to the next town where Paul goes to stir up trouble there too. And then finally, people say, Paul, you need to just go even further. And so they, they put him on a, on a boat and he goes off to Athens where he continues his ministry. But that's the vitriol in, in the Jews who don't believe in Christ. They're stirring up trouble, not only in Thessalonica, but they go 50 miles to where Paul went to Berea to try to stir it up there as well. And the church at Thessalonica starts under this cloud. You've got three weeks, that's all Paul is there, preaches the scriptures, tells people about who Christ is. People get saved. This little nucleus starts a little church. Meanwhile, you've got all this persecution, antagonism, riots, people who don't, who don't like this good news. That's what gospel means. They don't like this good news. Now, if you were part of a startup church in a town that was rioting about your faith, 
How strong would you stay in your faith? I mean, think about it. Uh, you, you, you're in an environment where everybody around you, aside from the small group of people who have become believers with you, are angry at you. I mean, to the point where th there's mob rioting about your faith in Christ. And this is challenging to me because I think, you know, here we are in the comfort and the coziness of our American freedom, which I'm very grateful for, the religious freedom that we have in our country, even though at times it's often being challenged in various ways. We have the luxury and the freedom and the pleasure of worshiping Jesus and following Jesus in our country. And yet, we experience a little embarrassment for our faith and we bail. This church survived because there were people who were so serious about their faith that they didn't care whether there were mob riots around them. They didn't care if their life was in jeopardy. They're gonna follow Jesus. They love him so much because of his demonstration of his love for them. And sometimes I think we can get so isolated and insulated in this little Christian bubble and we have no idea what a lot of people face for their faith. We have no idea around the world even today what a lot of people face for their faith. So how much more then should we be strong in the Lord? Because we have, we, have, we have no excuse. I mean, what threats are, are we under for our faith? So why are we embarrassed about Jesus? And why do we shrink back from declaring who he is? And why are we so careful about who's gonna see our Bible on our desk or in our backpack? Or why are we so concerned? You know, Paul talks about how I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God for salvation unto all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These people here, their very lives were on the line for following Christ. I don't think any of ours is. But this is the kind of antagonism and vitriol that was opposing them as this church started. So Paul, about a year later, is going to write to them some encouraging things about stay strong, trials will come, persecution's going to happen, you're going to be tempted in your flesh, so those things are going to happen too, but Jesus is coming, so hold on to your faith, hold on to the hope, Jesus is coming again, but in the meantime, you're going to have some trials and temptations. Now that's all the background to this, so let's go back to 1 Thessalonians now and take a look here at least at chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of, Thess of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. That's the common introduction of Paul's epistles, grace and peace. That's the Greek and the Jewish greeting, charis and shalom to you. He says in verse 2, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice those words, not just work, labor, and endurance, but faith, love, and hope. That's a common theme of Paul's throughout his epistles, particularly remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when you talk, it's the love chapter, he talks about all these great qualities of love, and, the, and then he says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Those, those are the, the main things about our faith, faith, love, hope. He says in verse 4, for we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. 
Now, no, notice again, verse 4, he talks about how God has chosen you. We are chosen in him. Okay, this gets a, a bit controversial. We talked in, in our study of Ephesians, particularly about, you know, who's chosen, who's not, and how does God go about choosing. Look, again, think of this in a corporate sense. In the Old Testament, the chosen ones of God were the, is the Israelites. And even though the church has not replaced the Israelites, the parallel is the same. God spoke about the people of Israel in a corporate sense being chosen. And when you get to the New Testament, it's no different. He speaks about the corporate church as being chosen. Those who belong to Christ are the chosen ones. Don't get wrapped around the axle with this. And people worry like God chooses them like petals on a daisy. He chose me, he chose me not. He chose me, he chose, am I part of the chosen? Get saved and then you're part of the chosen. It settles it. It's just like, I wonder if I am. If you love Jesus, you surrender your life to him. You're chosen, all right? So let's move on. And he talks about how the gospel came to you. And I love this. It's not just with words. It's also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, he says. And he says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. Notice, he, he talks about how his own example. He says, you know how we lived among you for your, so, your sake. And verse six, you became imitators of us. You became imitators. It's, the word imitators in the Greek is mimetes. We get our English word mimic or mime. And when, when you know, we've, we've got uh, little grandbabies now. And so, you know, Riley's like a year and a half now. And so, you know how kids are. They will mimic everything you do. And, uh, um, that's just the way kids are. They see what you do, they mimic you. So be careful when you're around kids because they will see and they will mimic exactly what you do. Um, I'm thinking of a story, not of my own, but I'm thinking of a story of how this, <laughs> this, uh, this kid that I, that I, uh, this family that I know of, not here at the church, not here at the church, I wouldn't call you out, but this family that I know of, their, their little kid was about five years old and got mad, something about his toys, got mad, got really mad, and one day he said, he said, he's just throwing this little temp, temper tantrum, and I won't say the word, but I'll, I'll just abbreviate, he goes, what the H is going on around here? <laughs> and you know what mom and dad realized? Mom and dad kind of used that word every now and again around the house. So the little five-year-old's gonna mimic what they hear mom and dad do. I think it's hilarious, but it's a sad, <laughs> it's a sad thing to laugh at, but it's, it's kind of to see a five-year-old, what the H is going on around here? But anyway, be careful, they will mimic us. Paul says here in a positive sense, you imitated us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. This is talking about that persecution now, they're living in a town that is riotous, got a mob, they don't like you, they're gonna persecute you. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. All right, let me summarize what we just read here and what I'm calling the gospel cycle. Out of verses four through eight, what you see here is this beautiful cycle that Paul talks about, and this is how the cycle goes, starting at the top. He says, the gospel came to you. That's what he says back up there in verse uh, four or verse five, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with Holy Spirit and deep conviction. And the next thing he says is, we modeled it. He says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. That's the rest of verse five. So the gospel came to you. Secondly, we modeled it. And then in verse, um, he, he says, and then you received it. You received the gospel. And then you became imitators you, you mimicked our relationship with Christ. You followed our example. You modeled it. And then he says, and then the gospel goes out from you. That's verse 7. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And, and then he says, and the Lord's message rang out from you. And not only to Macedonia, which is the local area, and Achaia, the local province, your faith in God has become known everywhere. So this is that gospel cycle. And this is the way it still happens with us today. The gospel comes to you. 
you know, if, if you know Christ as your Savior, at some point you responded to the truth of the gospel, whether it was here at Cornerstone or some other place previously, where some friend shared the truth of Scripture with you. You heard the gospel. You heard the good news about Christ. It came to you. And then it came to you because people were showing it to you, not just with words. They were living it out. You saw the truth revealed through the lives of other people as, as it was modeled to you. Then you received the gospel. You received the truth. You believed the truth. You responded to the truth. You became born again. You became a Christian. Then you started to model it. The gospel then is modeled in your lifestyle. People can see you live it out. And then the gospel goes forth from you. This is the beautiful cycle of the gospel. This is the way it's always been. You hear the gospel, you see it modeled, you receive it, your life has changed, you start to model it now, and then the gospel goes forth from you. And this is the way it continues to go. And I love how Paul says here, and not just in your local region, he says your faith in God has become known everywhere. Everywhere. And this is before the, the technology age, the information age. Their reputation had spread so far and wide that Paul said about this church, everywhere I go, people talk about you and your faith. Now, let me tell you how this challenges me. You and I need to read this and think to ourselves, everywhere we go, can people see clearly our faith in Christ? Is it a mystery to them? Or is it clear everywhere we go? Does our reputation precede us in terms of our faith in Christ? Now, I ask this question on two levels. I ask this question corporately, because as the pastor of Cornerstone, I constantly am wanting and, you know, to be sure, like, are we, are we making a difference? Like, is the gospel going forth from our church corporately? And then we need to ask the question individually. Now, I, I just, I get these kind of things often and you don't get to join in in the joy. So I just wanted to share with you in the last week, two particular emails I got just about how the gospel's going out from our church corporately. And, and now through the wonder of technology with our services all being live uh, broadcast and then with our radio ministry around the country. So I got this letter from a guy just like two days ago who said, I'm blessed by the teaching in fact, the program that was aired yesterday, he's talking about the radio. He, li he listens to us on the Bridge FM. It's up in New Jersey, 103.1. He says, I'm blessed by the teaching. In fact, the program that was aired yesterday ended with exactly what I needed to hear, having been hit recently with excessive worry over things I cannot control. And he says, now I look forward to the commute home for another reason, because the program airs between 6 and 6.30, like drive time. And he says, I'm glad that Cornerstone is on the bridge in that time slot. I got this other beautiful email from this guy in uh, Campbellsville, Kentucky. He said, in January 2016, my small church started Wednesday night services using the audio from the study of Revelation from our church. He says, my life was changed within three weeks of starting the study. Tonight, I will be leading a video study of judges from our teaching library. On, in their Wednesday night service. So this small little church in Campbellsville, Kentucky is taking the church services that we have archived on our website and they're broadcasting it there in their sanctuary and having their own Wednesday night church service. I was so blessed by this. And he said, this is the third year now that we have been leading Bible studies using the material of your church. Our church is very thankful to your website and how it provides those that are seeking an opportunity to find it. We're in Campbellsville, Campbellsville Kentucky, also located on the Green River Lake. Probably if the numbers were checked in our area, talking about the hits on the website, we'd have multiple hundreds of hits. Probably will be a thousand or more as much as I listen to your website. Pray for our small church and for our success with our Wednesday night service. Isn't that a blessing just to hear what God is doing? So there are many ways that hopefully we're corporately getting the gospel out to be a part of this cycle. But this is a challenge to us individually, I hope, that wherever we go, we are a part of this cycle of the gospel and that our reputation as individuals is known by others as being believers. It was Benjamin Franklin who said that it takes many good deeds to build a good rep reputation, but only one bad one to lose it. And so we have to be always conscious of our walk with the Lord and of our 
relationship with him because people are watching. And could it be said of us, as Paul said of this church and those who were part of this church, your faith in God has become known everywhere. And he adds there in verse 8, therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They, others, tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, I want you to circle two words in that last verse, verse 10. I want you to circle the word wait and wrath. Wait and wrath. There are many verses in the New Testament, I'm going to give you some, that speak of the importance of waiting for the Lord's return. Here's one, Hebrews 9, 28. Hebrews 9, 28 says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Listen to this out of James 5, verses 7 to 8. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And then this, 2 Peter chapter 3. They will say, meaning people who don't believe in the return of Christ, they will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So over and over again in the Bible, I just read Hebrews, I read James, I read 2 Peter, and then you have it here in 1 Thessalonians. The objective now is that we wait, and we wait patiently for the return of Christ. I don't know when he's coming again, and anybody who presumes to know a date and tries to predict it is a false prophet. Jesus himself said, no one knows the day nor the hour for the return of Christ. Jesus said, not even the Son, but only the Father who is in heaven. So God has a divine timetable and Jesus is going to come again when God has determined that his second coming shall appear. In the meantime, we wait. Now, why is he delaying? Why doesn't he just come back now? Why didn't he come back 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago? Why is he waiting? Listen, he's waiting for as many people as possible who will surrender their hearts to him. That's why he's waiting. God wants none to perish. He wants as many to come to repentance. So he's waiting, and he's waiting patiently. But there will come a day when time is up. Time is up. Don't get too comfortable, friends. Because there will come a day when time is up, and God will say, enough is enough. I've waited long enough, and his patience will reach a limit. And then Christ will return. So we have to be ready. But his patience is extended to us. His delay is because he wants as many people to be saved so that we can be rescued from the coming wrath. That's the other word that I asked you to circle there in verse 10, because Paul reminds us here that we're to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised, God raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, the question is, what wrath exactly is he speaking of here? Is it the wrath of hell? Or is it the wrath of the great tribulation? Because there is a period of time, the Bible teaches, a seven-year period of tribulation that will come upon the earth. And it will be a catastrophic event, series of events for seven years. The earth itself will be completely, completely uh, devastated by the judgment of the Lord. So is Paul saying here, hey, Jesus is coming again, so wait patiently, because you're going to be spared from the wrath of hell or is he saying you're going to be spared from the wrath of the second of, of the tribulation? Yes. I mean, does it matter? I mean, whatever wrath and whatever form the wrath comes, I want to be rescued from it. Amen? I want to be rescued from the wrath. If it's the wrath of hell, thank you, Lord. You died for my sins to rescue me from the wrath of hell. Or is it the wrath of the second coming? 
I think, and most Bible scholars believe, that in the context of all of this discussion about the second coming, that the church will be rescued by the Lord prior to the tribulation. Well, there's three people glad about that. <laughs> and I join in the applause, but if you'll glance ahead to chapter five, and, and we'll get into more details when we get further into this letter, but if you'll, if you'll look into chapter five, He speaks about this coming wrath. He, he gives like a, um, a preview of the tribulation in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction, that's, that's the inference to the seven years of tribulation, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Okay, there's a coming wrath of God, and we'll, we'll talk, when we get to chapter 5, we'll, we'll parallel it with the book of Revelation. So we'll get into a little bit of Revelation when we get further in this letter. But glance further into chapter 5, verse 9, because this is a great verse. This is a great verse from verse 9 of chapter 5. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now I know plenty of Christians, and we'll get into this more later in, the, in our study. I know plenty of Christians who believe in, in the position of what's called post-trib, post-tribulation, which basically means that there are Christians who believe, some who believe that Christians go through the tribulation period and then they get rescued by Jesus. But I like 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. <laughs> and I don't like it just because I'm a mamsie and I don't wanna go through seven years of tribulation. I like it because I believe theologically, contextually, doctrinally, it makes the most sense that destruction's coming upon the earth. Oh, by the way, God has not appointed us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a rescue that happens for the church. It's detailed in chapter four, but we got a lot more to get to before we get to the closing chapters of this letter, and we'll pick it up there next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the promise of your second coming. And Lord, we want to be ready. And we want to examine our lives. And we want to walk in a way that honors you, that glorifies you. And so, Lord, I pray that even tonight, if some of us are playing games with you, that we get serious with you. Because we don't know the day or the hour that you could return. But there's nothing standing between now and your return in the air to get the church. No, no other prophecy, Lord, so you could come at any time. We pray that you'd find us faithful and watching and ready and eagerly looking forward to your second coming. Thank you, Lord, that you have not appointed us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for those who don't know you, Lord, if they don't have a saving knowledge of you, if, they, if they're not born again, that even tonight they would pray to invite you into their hearts, that they would ask you to forgive them of their sins, that they might have relationship with you, not motivated by fear, but motivated by the future, that we can spend eternity with you if we know you in a personal way, having our sins forgiven. And then, Lord, no matter when you come or when we die, whichever happens first, we'll be ready to see you. We'll be ready to be with you. So I'm going to pause in my prayer before I close our service and just invite you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, not motivated by fear, but motivated by faith, that you would surrender your heart to him tonight and invite Jesus into your life. And you can simply do it by praying a prayer like this. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for me. Come into my life and save me and forgive me of my sins. I want to be ready when you come or when I die, whichever happens first, I want to be ready to see you. Save me, Lord, forgive me. 
Thank you for loving me. Come into my life. Change my heart. I yield my life to you. In Jesus' name. And Lord, for all of us who have already prayed a prayer like that, may we leave tonight reminded of your imminent return. And may the study through this letter remind us that you could come at any moment. So may we get serious about you. And may you find us faithful. If there's any compromise in our lives, Lord, challenge us that we might purify our hearts. We might draw near to you. We might be serious about our faith. And we love you together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.